The World Affairs Council of Orange County is pleased this evening to have Dr. Paul Salem, the president of the Middle East Institute, as our guest speaker tonight. Uh, he flew in from Washington, D.C., from that think tank uh, that he belongs to. Welcome to the Orange County Crosstalk Show. I'm Alex Bellucci. The World Affairs Council of Orange County has an exciting program tonight on rethinking strategy and engagement U.S. policy in the turbulent Middle East. And the keynote speaker is Dr. Paul Salem. Dr. Salem is the president of the Middle East uh, Institute in Washington, D.C., and he's the founding director of the Carnegie Middle East Center. In a moment, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. Serge uh, Tomasian, former chairman of the World Affairs Council and one of the executive director of the World Affairs Council and uh, uh, ambassador at large, to give us a little brief of tonight's program. Rethinking strategy and engagement, U.S. policy in the turbulent Middle East. Wow, that's such a big turbulent Middle East. Middle it's, East, exactly. It is and the keynote speaker, I let uh, Mr. Serge Tomasian to introduce the keynote speaker and give us a little brief uh, of the tonight's talk. Mr. Tomasian is the former chairperson of the World Affairs Council of French County and also one of the executive director and ambassador. Ambassador at large for at the large. World Affairs Council. We got big the title. title. I can't I can remember what they gave me. So give us a little brief on what's going on tonight, and then uh, after the after the talk, Mr. Tomasian is going to give his analysis of the, the tonight's uh, speaker talk. Okay. Thank Here you, we. Alex. Yes, uh, the World Affairs Council of Orange County is pleased this evening to have Dr. Paul Salem, the president of the Middle East Institute, as our guest speaker tonight. Uh, he flew in from Washington, D.C., from that think tank uh, that he belongs to, as, which he's president of. And we're very pleased to have him speak on a very timely topic, which is U.S. policy, of course, and engagement uh, in the Middle East, which, you know, as we know, and we have titled as being a turbulent area, certainly a controversial area. Uh, and uh, one of the things he's going to analyze tonight, uh, of course, is the U.S. policies, the impact it ha they have, uh, on the various nations in the Middle East, including Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and the neighboring countries. So we're very glad to have Paul here. He is an authority on the Middle East. Uh, as the member of the executive board of the National World Affairs Councils of America, I heard him speak last uh, fall in Washington, D.C., and thought he gave an excellent analysis and presentation on the, uh, uh, the role of the U.S. in the Middle East and areas in which he critiqued that. So we're very happy to have him. Found out that Paul actually, uh, his father was the former uh, foreign minister of Lebanon during the very critical years of 1982 and 1988, uh, when various things happened there, unfortunate. There was the Marine barracks bombing in 1983. I happened to be in Europe at that time when I heard that news. Uh, and as well as the, uh, the battle between Israel and some of the Palestinian forces that took place in Lebanon. So we're very pleased to have uh, Paul this, this evening as our speaker. And the World Affairs Council is always pleased to offer a diversity of speakers on various topics. Certainly the Middle East is one of those topics that comes up uh, frequently in the news and interest to our members. And uh, I just want to say that uh, one of the topics he will touch upon tonight is what we'll call the Trump Kushner proposed peace plan, uh, which was engaged by the Israelis, but not by the Palestinians. And so it should be a very interesting analysis, Alex. Uh, we're interesting to see, interesting to see what, uh, what critique he has, uh, what areas we are positive in, we're doing positive things, and what areas can be improved. So thank you very much for, for attending. Uh, that was a wonderful brief, and I'm, I'm sure, as we have done in the past, at the end of the program, you're going to give a little analysis of yes. this talk, correct? So, 
So uh, any other uh, future program that you are uh, planning for? I know, I know you are um, like ambassador. Tell us yes. exactly what's, what's going well, on. Well, one of our other programs coming up in the near future is uh, retired General Votel, V-O-T-E-L, is going to become as our speaker. I believe he was the former chairman of the uh, Joint Command. Uh, we're going to do a program on uh, human trafficking. Oh my uh, one of the issues that uh, not only is a concern internationally, yes. but here in Orange County. Exactly. Uh, and uh, we have another program on international trade investment with a sister organization that we're affiliating with based out of uh, the Long Beach area. So on trade, import, and export. And so with the uh, coronavirus, this should be very interesting in terms of what's going to happen to our, to our operations here in the United States in terms of importing because of what's happening in China. And, and so we're going to have a program on that as well, Alex. All right. Uh, I'm hoping everybody who is watching this program will join the World Affairs Council of Orange County and enjoy the program. They have wonderful program as we have done it in the past. So, looking forward to, uh, for the analysis of the talk. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Most of you know me. I'm Nora Valenzuela, well, chairman of the board. It is my honor indeed to introduce a very knowledgeable man. I have not heard him speak in person, but I've heard great things about uh, his uh, talent and knowledge. Um, this gentleman does come from Middle East, where I also came from. And no, I'm not Hispanic. I know. The last name Valenzuela does confuse people, and sometimes people gossip about Persians in front of me, <laughs> thinking I'm Hispanic, and I love that. When they said we should send those Persians somewhere or Iranians in, in, you know, thinking I'm Hispanic. So I had a lot of fun with that. But yeah, it did actually happen. So anyway, Dr. Um, Paul Salem is the president of Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. He received his BA, MA, and PhD from Harvard. And I was asking him why he still has a little bit of accent. I mean, he. He was born in the U.S. His parents took him back to Lebanon. He was raised in Lebanon, and then he came back to U.S. So he'll share with you more about his life. He's an expert on regional and international relation of the Middle East. He's the founding director of Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut, Lebanon, founder and former director of Lebanese Center for Policy Studies, Lebanon's leading public policy think tank. He's also the author of several books and many articles and reports on the Middle East. With everything that is going on in our politics and our world today, more than ever it's important for us to understand Middle East and our policies there. Perhaps through understanding we can resolve some of the future resolution. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Salem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nora, and uh, thank you, Serge, and thank you, Medina, thank you, Jake, thank you to the World Affairs Council of Orange County for having me here tonight. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about U.S. interests in the Middle East, U.S. policy uh, in the Middle East, and uh, sort of presenting an outline of uh, sort of a vision of strategy and policy for the next administration, 2021, whether it's a, a second Trump administration or a Democratic administration. Let me start with U.S. interests, then and now. Uh, when we look at uh, America's relationship, uh, relationships in the Middle East, the oldest is the relationship with Saudi Arabia, which uh, three days ago celebrated the 75th anniversary of President Roosevelt and King Abdelaziz meeting on a boat in the Red Sea. Uh, that relationship was based on America's need for oil and endured for 75 years. The U.S. no longer needs uh, uh, Middle East oil in the same way, so that certainly has changed. Uh, the second oldest relationship is with Israel, a relationship 73 years old. Um, and one that was based on the moral and political support for a Jewish homeland after the Holocaust and supporting a young Israel, a David, among Goliaths of the region. That too has changed. Israel now itself is a Goliath among Davids 
of the Middle East, very different. Uh, the U.S. has long partnerships with Turkey, with Egypt, with Pakistan, with pre-1979 Iran. Those were based on the Cold War against the Soviet Union, which was a big driving force of U.S. policy. Soviet Union is no longer around. So the bases of U.S. interests and U.S. relationships have all fundamentally changed. Where does, it, where does that sort of leave us now? What are U.S. interests in the Middle East today? And I would mention seven of them. And I would, off the bat, mention that they are not as acute and not as intense as they were before. The interests are more limited and not as existential as they were before. The first interest today remains energy. The U.S. is an energy net exporter, that's true. It doesn't need directly to consume the energy of the Middle East, but it, uh, U.S. energy markets, U.S. economy is still very much affected by global oil prices. So controlling the flow of oil from the Persian Gulf remains a U.S. national security interest. The, the role also of petrodollars and Saudi money and others in investments in the U.S. economy and purchase of, e of U.S. equipment is also important. So energy is not existential anymore. It's doubtful that the U.S. would ever go to war again for energy, but it is important. Second interest. Since 1979, Iran has been a main issue for the U.S. in the region. Goes back to the hostage crisis that began in 79 and 80, to attacks on U.S. embassies and facilities, all the way to uh, a few months ago, uh, attacks on U.S. personnel, attacks on a U.S. drone. This conflict is 41 years old and continues to this day. And the U.S. interest in deterring or confronting or containing or negotiating with Iran has driven U.S. policy for a long time and remains an interest of the U.S. to try to contain and to deter Iran or deal with Iran in some way. Third interest, the war on terror. This erupted into the U.S on 9-11, and that's eight, 19 years ago today. Uh, and that been, has been a driving force of U.S. engagement in the region, certainly in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also in many, many other countries around the region and around the world. Uh, and that is something that still drives U.S. security and policy makers. Fourth interest is weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and Iran has been the headline for that uh, in the last uh, decade. President Obama tried to deal with it through negotiation. President Trump has withdrawn from the nuclear agreement and imposed economic sanctions. But the concern about nuclear weapons uh, uh, it remains a driving force of U.S. policy and remains a national security interest. Of course, Israel has nuclear weapons, but none of the other countries does the U.S. Uh, allow or think should have nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction. A uh, fifth interest remains the security of Israel. Now Israel can take care of itself. Israel is a Goliath among Davids today, but as you see in presidential debates or in policies of Democratic and uh, Republican administrations, the welfare of Israel, the security of Israel remains important, as is to a lesser degree the security of other partners in the region like Saudi Arabia, like the United Arab Emir Emirates and others. So that's a fifth interest. A sixth interest is concern recently about refugee flows. The refugee flows from Syria upended politics in, in, uh, in Europe. They dissolved, uh, well, they led to the Brexit vote in, uh, uh, in, in, in Britain and the exit from the EU. And they've upended politics in Europe. They also, I would say, upended politics in the US as well. The flow of refugees from the Middle East, whether it's from Syria or from Yemen or from Libya, uh, remains a national security concern for the United States. A seventh and perhaps newest interest, and it is uh, put front and center in the U.S. national security strategy, is the return of great power competition, competing with Russia and China in the Middle East. Russia is back. It's back in Syria in a big way. It's also back in Libya. And China is a major investor in infrastructure and technology and trade and energy throughout the Middle East. So those seven interests remain in the Middle East. Uh, and they, they are maybe not as acute as the old interest, but they, are, they underpin why the U.S. still remains in the region for 
uh, for, for the time being and probably for the foreseeable future. How did the US previously, what models, what strategic models did it employ to try to preserve and promote its interest in the Middle East? And I would identify four time periods from 1945 to 1990, so throughout the entire Cold War, the US strategy was one of offshore balancer, staying away from the Middle East, working with allies, supporting them, but not sending armies in any large scale to the Me Middle East itself, staying offshore. 1991, you remember the uh, George H.W. Bush administration sent an army into the Gulf to push Iraq out of Kuwait. That was the first major U.S. deployment in the region. And note that it was made after the Soviet Union effectively had ceased to be a deterrent. So the U.S. felt free to interfere and, 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 and sort of have a large presence in the Middle East. Uh, uh, that led to a period between 1991 and 2001, which was, I describe as a period of being an onshore policeman troops in the area, monitoring what's going on, trying to keep the stability of the region. That was followed after the attacks of 9-11 by a period between 2001 and 2007, the George W. Bush administration, where the US tried to be effectively a transformative hegemon, to go into the region, upend regimes, change the entire region. The model, in a sense, was like Western Europe, World War II, or Japan, World War II, where you use military means, change a regime, establish a democratic and uh, sort of liberal market system, and hope that like Germany, West Germany became a US ally and Japan became a US ally, that Iraq would do so, Afghanistan would do so. Of course, none of that at all worked out, uh, and those uh, dreams sort of ended in the sands of, Afga of Iraq and the hills of Afghanistan, which led to the current period that we're in, from 2008 to 2020, both the Obama administration and the Trump administration, which have attempted to withdraw from the Middle East and attempted to go back to the old model of being an offshore balancer. The problem with that is that to be an offshore balancer, you need two things. You need to have a balance that you're preserving, and currently there is no balance in the Middle East. U.S. actions, rather than limit and contain Iran, ended up empowering it. And Iran is now uh, very present in Iraq, and Syria, and Lebanon, in Yemen, uh, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and it, it is not a balance that can be preserved. Secondly, balancing works when you're dealing with states. Balancing does not work if you're dealing with failed states, or armed non-state actors, or terrorist groups. You can't balance with ISIS, or balance with Hezbollah, or balance with Al-Qaeda. So that's why, even though both Obama and Trump wanted to get out, particularly of the conflict zones, so far they haven't been able to do so. What is the current political context that the US finds itself in? I think that is pretty clear. The US public, since 2008, has basically been clear, demanding a withdrawal of the US from endless wars in the Middle East. That's what President Obama ran on and was elected on, and that's what President Trump partly ran on and was elected on. That position is also shared by almost every Democratic candidate that you hear on the Democratic debates. So there is a consensus in both parties uh, that the US needs to get out of the wars in the Middle East that have been going on for two decades and that have not paid almost any dividends whatsoever, but have been at great cost both in terms of blood and treasure. What would be the out outlines of a path forward? One point I'll mention, U.S. interests, as I've mentioned, have decreased in intensity and urgency, but the U.S. still has enduring economic and security interests. In that sense, it cannot fully walk away from the Middle East. Second, we must understand that what, we, what is meant by withdrawal is effectively a retrenchment or a reduction or a rearrangement of presence, not a full withdrawal. It, it, it tends to talk about withdrawal from three conflict zones, which are effectively Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. It does not also mean withdrawal from the Gulf, withdrawal from alliances and partnerships throughout the region, which pay dividends at a very low cost. Uh, we must understand also that retrenchment or recalibration will, re will require a de-escalation of conflict 
in the Middle East in order to endanger en engender enough stability for the U.S. to be able to pull back. And this relates to three major conflict systems. One I've already mentioned is the conflict with Iran. It's been going on for 41 years. It shapes much of U.S. policy towards the region. It's an integral part of the conflict in Iraq, the conflict in Syria, the conflict in Afghanistan, instability in Lebanon, civil war in, Ye in Yemen, instability in Bahrain. It fuels a lot of the radicalization, both Shiite and Sunni, that has led to the proliferation of terrorist groups. So this core conflict between the U.S. and Iran uh, is something that has to be dealt with if the U.S. is going to be able to sort of ease, ease, ease out and retrench. A second long-standing conflict, 73 years old, is the Israel-Palestine conflict. And by extension, the logjam in relations between Israel and the entire Arab world and between Israel and the entire Muslim world. Uh, this conflict, it's true, doesn't have the centrality today that it once had in the region, but it continues to generate conflict, obviously among Palestinians and Israelis, which trade shells and and, and wars every couple of years. It threatens stability in Egypt, in Jordan, and in Lebanon. It fuels and justifies jihadist and terrorist groups, both Shiite and Sunni, throughout the region. And it continues to weigh heavily on America's image and America's credibility in the region. That is a conflict that needs to be resolved. And I'll come back to that. The third conflict is the recent conflict between the main Sunni states in the region, all of which are our friends. Uh, and that is a conflict largely over the role of the Muslim Brotherhood and the politics of that party, uh, which sees the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Bahrain on one side, and Turkey and Qatar on the other. They are all American friends, they are all American partners, but they're fighting amongst each other. That weakens the Gulf Cooperation Council, it weakens America's partnerships in the region, fuels civil war in Libya, and uh, brings no end of trouble as well. So those are three key conflict uh, systems. If we were are to look to 2021, uh, whether it's a second Trump administration or a new Democratic administration, what might be the main elements of a policy moving forward? And I list six or seven of them. The first, use the enormous leverage that this administration has built over Iran using very, very intense economic sanctions to engage in a serious strategic negotiation with Iran, and a very tough negotiation with Iran. If the US, using this leverage, can get Iran to normalize its foreign policy, and it violates almost every norm of foreign policy, if it can normalize its foreign policy and behave like a state, not a revolution, towards the US, towards Israel, towards its regional neighbors, uh, in the Arab countries in exchange for the full lifting of U.S. sanctions, U.S. guarantees that it will not attack or, or pursue regime change, and encouragement of economic development and growth in, in Iran, that could bring about potentially uh, an opportunity. As I said, a resolution or reduction of conflict with Iran would positively impact U.S. interests in Iraq, U.S. interests in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Bahrain, and in the Persian Gulf. And it would diffuse 41 years of sectarian radicalization that has completely overtaken and changed the Middle East, and I would say changed the world. Second component, lean on the Gulf states and our Sunni partners, like Egypt and Turkey, to work on resolving their differences. This would, this would revive the Gulf Cooperation Council, which was our main partner in the Gulf and our main partner in sort of pressuring and countering Iran. It would strengthen the coordination among all of our Sunni allies, which is helpful in itself, but also important in dealing with Iran and getting to a good outcome there. It would likely end the civil war in Libya and stabilize the situation in Egypt. So very many benefits there. Third step is to reconsider the so-called Trump peace plan that was announced a few weeks ago. Uh, the plan that was announced was effectively an endorsement of sort of uh, the Israeli position, or I would say Prime Minister Netanyahu and the right-wing government's position. It effectively ends the potential for even a semblance of a peace process, and it also precludes 
the eventual possibility of a two-state solution. Now that might be okay for the president, might be okay for the prime minister Netanyahu, but it leaves, in the absence of a two-state solution, it leaves the Israelis and the Palestinians with the proposition of the one-state solution, and that is likely to become the Palestinians' demand in the years ahead, as the idea of their own state will, will is dissolved effectively, they will begin demanding equal rights in the Israeli state. And that will lead to conflict, perhaps civil war, in this greater Israel that is being created, likely with the annexation of settlements on the, on the West Bank. I think it's imperative in a second Trump administration or a democratic uh, uh, or an alternative democratic administration, if it's a second term Trump administration, Trump can pivot on the fact that he does call this plan a vision. He doesn't say it's set policy, so it's a starting point. Uh, but uh, there needs to be a return to negotiation between the Israel Israelis and the Palestinians, and there needs to be a preservation of a pathway for two states at some point in the future, no matter how difficult that is. That is not only a key to stabilizing Israel and stabilizing the relationship with the Palestinians and improving the lives of Palestinians, but then that would enable a normalization of relations between Israel and the Arab states, and Israel and many of the Muslim world states, and that would be a great uh, uh, factor for de-escalation and stability in the Middle East in general. Fourth objective, the U.S. can and should maintain its wide political, economic, and security partnerships in the region. Not deployments, but partnerships. Uh, it, it, it is the biggest alliance network uh, of, any, of any, certainly of any power, uh, certainly, Russia has only one, one ally in the Middle East, or two. Uh, China is an important economic player, but has no geopolitical allies. And the U.S. benefits economically, benefits politically, should not walk away from those relationships which span all the way from Morocco through to Oman and Pakistan. Fifth, with regard to the war on terror, which has cost so many lives and so much treasure. We have won many battles, but have been losing the war. There are more terrorists and terrorist groups today than on the eve of 9-11. And they're in more countries, way more countries, than they were in 2001. Leading almost exclusively with the military has won us some battles, but has also increased the number of failed states, raised the level of tension in the region and conflict, and created conditions that have favored terrorist groups. The war on terror moving forward should be seen as an intelligence, special operations, and policing task undertaken with partners and allies in the region, even reaching out with adversary, to adversaries in some cases where interests align, rather than being seen as a conventional war. We should recognize that homeland security will not be achieved by victory on Middle Eastern battlefields, Indeed, we've been in these battlefields for 20 years, and we have not defeated ISIS, we have not defeated Al-Qaeda in any uh, definitive way. Uh, and radical Islamic terrorism is going to be with us for a generation or more. But homeland security will be preserved by a continuation of the past 19 years of effective coordination in homeland security and effective coordination with intelligence and special operations abroad. The wider strategy in the war on terror should be to address and diffuse the geopolitical drivers that have fueled radicalization and, uh, and fueled or enabled armed non-state actors and terrorist groups. And what are those conditions? One, we need to work on reversing the weaponization of sectarianism, Shiite and Sunni, that was unleashed 41 years ago. It was partly unleashed by the Islamic Revolution of Iran, which mobilized uh, Islamists and mos mobilized Shiite Islamists throughout the Muslim world. But it was also fueled by Saudi Arabia, partly in response to the Islamic Revolution in Iran, partly in response to the takeover of the Great Mosque of Mecca in 1979 by a radical Sunni Islamic group. So Saudi Arabia has been a major player in weaponizing Sunni Islam. It was also fueled by the United States, working with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan in our decision to arm the radical jihadist opposition in Afghanistan against the Soviets. 
And we've been reaping the benefits or the effects of that policy ever since. We were complicit in unleashing a sectarian civil war in the Middle East. And we have reaped our full share of the consequences. Dealing with this 41 year wound or rift implies finding a better relationship with Iran, robust, tough negotiation leading to a change of behavior, encouraging Saudi Arabia's recent turn away from Islamic radicalism, and this is something very, very significant that's taking place in Saudi Arabia after 41 years, if not 100 years of, of fueling radicalism from Riyadh, and thirdly, de-escalating the conflict in Afghanistan and continuing to lead, lean on Pakistan to disempower radical jihadists. The other geopolitical driver of terrorism is failed states themselves and civil wars. In a sense, one of the US's real enemies in the Middle East are failed states themselves because they provide the space for armed non-state actors and terrorist groups to flourish. That's where they live. The key to weakening terrorist groups, therefore, is by removing the ungoverned space within which they can flourish. This means working to end civil wars and stand up failed states. That means working to end the civil war in Yemen, working to try to end the civil war in Libya, much more challenging to try to end the civil war in Syria, and certainly very challenging to end it in Afghanistan. But imagining that the US can be relaxed and not worried while four or five civil wars are raging in the Middle East is unrealistic. A sixth point in the seven, six, or six or seven points that I wanted to mention for a new administration is the matter of great power competition, which has now become very much front and center, certainly in the, in the Department of Defense approach uh, uh, to the world, but also in Congress and in, in, in either White House, whether Republican or Democrat. This is obviously a returning concern for the US, but not comparable to the worries of the Cold War and the challenges that were faced then. Indeed, the US has a mix of competing and common interests in the Middle East with the other great powers, basically Russia and China. Both Russia and China are hostile to jihadist terrorist groups, in some cases more hostile than we are. They are a very grave concern for the Russians, they are a very grave concern for the Chinese. Both Russia and China share our position against Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. That's a very serious position of theirs. That's why they were partners with us in the JCPOA. And both Russia and China favor states, not armed non-state actors. They favor states, not militias, as do we. On the flip side, both Russia and China would like to see US influence reduced in the Middle East, and they want larger spheres of influence. Both want to encroach on economic interests that the US currently has access to. And both are very hostile to democratic movements or democratic principles and values and favor the consolidation of authoritarian systems as the way to go in the 21st century. The US is going to have to balance its policies towards these rival powers in order to build on some of the common interests, and they are some, and compete effectively but safely in areas where there is competition. In closing then, the challenge and opportunity for the next US administration is to revise US policy and engagement in the Middle East in order to reduce America's footprint and exposure in the Middle East, respond to the public's demand to bring our combat troops home from active conflict zones, and to raise up economic and diplomatic tools alongside or ahead of our military stick. And to do that within an integrated strategy that reduces conflict with Iran and changes Iran's behavior, that de-escalates regional and sectarian conflict and radicalization, that implements steady but studied withdrawals of fighting forces from Syria, from Iraq, and from Afghanistan, that works to end civil wars and stand up failed states, that breathes life back into the Israeli-Palestinian two-state pathway, and that manages the growing competition 
with our global rivals. These challenges are not simple. These challenges are not easy. But this administration has acquired significant leverage in many arenas. And for the past 20 years, we have careened between rushing in too fast and too much and rushing out too precipitously without much of a strategy. Both rushing in and rushing out are destabilizing and potentially harmful to US interest. There is a sustainable medium. And in the end, that sustainable medium would be a return to America's long-standing and preferred strategic role in the Middle East, which would be that of an offshore balancer. Working through allies, deterring adversaries, and preserving US interests without undue exposure or expenditure of US blood or US treasure. Thank you. I'll stop there, and then we'll <laughs> go to the Q&A. Um, thank you so much. Wonderful, and really appreciate your insight. We have QA cards on your tables, the blue cards, if you be kind. And for those of you who are still interested to add questions, please do so. Our interns are coming around and picking up the card. Mr. Serge Tomasian, who is one of our previous uh, chairman of the boards, will be the moderator for the QAs. And hopefully at the end of the event, we'll have opportunities for photos uh, with Mr. Salem, he, since he's a celebrity. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I don't know.